Well, saints, fellow members of the household of God, let's turn uh, back together to Matthew chapter 1 that we were in uh, just this last evening. As I mentioned then, as we went through the genealogy uh, last evening, uh, this morning we will be finishing chapter 1, focusing on verses 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, the words of the living God read for us this morning. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. They called his name Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. Our great God and Savior, God our Father, would you, would you do that very thing? Would you bless the reading of your word this morning? We are here as your saints, as your church. We are here converted by you, by your grace to us in Christ Jesus through your eternal plan of the gospel. And we are in constant need of your grace. We are weak in and of ourselves. We are are unable to think and live in a manner that is pleasing in your sight apart from your grace. We are unable to be sanctified apart from you working in us that which is pleasing in your sight. Father, as one of your means of grace in, in growth, one of your aspects of worship is the preaching of your word and the hearing of your word. Father, would you use this as I pray that you you have used our our prior worship already, but would you use this in a uh, a, a great, uh, as a great means to sanctify your people here, to make us uh, holy, that we would more vividly show forth that holy calling that you have called us out to. You called us to be holy as you are holy. Lord Jesus, in your earthly ministry, you prayed to the Father that we would be sanctified. That we would be sanctified in, in the Father's truth as his word is truth. Would that be seen, would that be done this morning? In accordance with your word, in accordance with your promises, in accordance with your faithfulness. For the plans of your heart endure through all generations. May it be seen this day as we go through this text and and look at the circumstances of the birth of our Lord. Would your sheep be fed this morning? Would your name be hallowed in our hearts this morning as we worship you? May by your grace we be given uh, attentive minds. May we be active participants in your worship in the preaching of your word uh, this morning, showing one another, disciplining one another on how you have regulated yourself to be worshipped. We love you. We praise you. May this be done by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as the beginning verse of our text states for this morning, uh, we are putting our focus 
We are putting our focus from the Word of God on the birth of Jesus Christ. And I want to say, uh, before we get into the text, I want to say that we're, we're not doing that because we're bending to some kind of contemporary church standard that says, hey, it's Christmas, so you have to preach a Christmas sermon. Uh, we're not doing it because of that. Uh, it would be perfectly fine if we just continued right on in 1 Timothy. That would be perfectly fine if we did that. And it would be just as God-honoring and God-pleasing if we did that as well, because we're preaching his word just as he has regulated to be done. But this morning we, we are focusing on the birth of our Lord because as it is Christmas and as what Christmas is truly about, well, church, why would we not take this opportunity to exalt our God for the birth of our great God and Savior? Why would we not? Well, beloved, amongst the reading of the scriptures, amongst the preaching and hearing of the word of God, the singing it in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, the praying uh, in accordance with the word of God, in accordance with his will, and the partaking of the ordinances in putting God's word on display. Our confession that we hold to as a church that, that summarizes what our God teaches us in his word does rightly state, and I quote, that purposeful times of thanksgiving should or ought be observed on special occasions in a holy and religious manner. Purposeful times of thanksgiving should be observed on special occasions in a holy and religious manner. And I think we would agree that the birth of our Savior, that, that the, the Word of God, the living Word made flesh, God incarnate, truly God, truly man, something that should be given a special occasion of thanksgiving. I think we would, would agree with that. Uh, beloved, God incarnate came to save sinners. He entered into His own creation. And as we saw last evening in looking at the genealogy of our Lord, his birth is the culmination of all of God's promises of old to bring forth a redeemer. The offspring of the woman come to crush the head of the serpent, destroying the works of the devil as the Lord Jesus utterly and completely did on the cross. And beloved, there is no cross if there is no birth. Amen? There is no cross if there is no birth. So... While many in our land today will be rebelliously wasting this Lord's day that God has given them for their rest and worship, praise God that he has given us the grace to use this day for what it's for, and as well to do so on this special occasion to give thanks to him and to worship him for the birth of our Savior as well, for the fruition of all his promises of old seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do so, we are viewing this text that shows us the immediate circumstances surrounding the birth of our Lord. Uh, as Matthew tells us in verse 18, that his birth took place in this way. Or his birth took place in this manner. This is how it came to pass. This is how it happened. And as we examine this text, I have four headings that we'll be working under. As we'll view three different ways or aspects or, or manners in how the birth of our Lord took place. And then under our last heading, we will note how we, as God's people, as his church, ought to respond to such wonderful truths that God has revealed to us here in these verses. And so, beginning in the first heading, we will note that our Lord's birth took place in a miraculous way. It took place in a miraculous way. Verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So here we have brought forward to us that Mary, the mother of our Lord, was betrothed to Joseph. Uh, betrothal is somewhat similar to our modern day engagement before a marriage, yet it's also not similar because it was much more legally binding and serious than our modern day Engagement as well, so much so that you are already considered husband and wife in the betrothal. You'll see that, you remember from reading in verse 19, it calls Joseph her husband. And when he uh, perceived from her being with child that she had committed adultery, something we'll, that we'll get more into in the next heading, it says that he sought to divorce her. He didn't, he didn't just seek to break the engagement off. This was a legally binding thing. He sought to divorce her as he was her husband in this betrothal. So this is a much more serious thing than just mere engagement that we have today. And here we see that though they were betrothed, 
before they even came together, that's meaning intimately, sexually, as husband and wife, Mary was found to be with child. She wasn't found to be with child from being with a man. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, from God, from God himself. Uh, the child within Mary's womb had not been conceived by the normal or natural means that God has ordained children to be conceived through in his world. But the child was conceived in a supernatural way, a way that is not natural, a way that is not normal, a way that transcends the normal reality we live in, which is exactly why this happened in a miraculous way. A miracle, properly defined, is a distinctive work or event that breaks the natural order of existence to where it would be impossible to happen apart from divine intervention. Right? A distinctive work, a distinctive event that breaks the natural order of existence to where it would be impossible to happen apart from divine intervention. So I know at times we like to call really great things that happen in our world miracles. Oh, that was a miracle. That was, just, that was a really, really wonderful thing uh, that happened. But, beloved, just because something is great or amazing, that doesn't constitute it being a miracle. Just because something is really grand and lofty, that doesn't constitute it being a, a supernatural, breaking the, the normal reality that we live in. For example, though we absolutely love babies, a baby being born through a man and a woman, biblically understood and rightly understood through a husband and a wife, a baby being born through a husband and a wife is not a miracle in and of itself because that is a part of our natural order of existence. That is the normal way that God has ordained for that to happen. Babies are born every day through that way. They're, they're normally born every day through that way, through a husband and a wife being together. On the contrast, babies are not born from virgins every day. Babies are not born from women who have never been with a man every day. That is totally supernatural to this world, which is, again, exactly why this is miraculous. This child was not conceived through a man and a woman, but this child was conceived in the woman, in the Virgin Mary, from the God and creator of the universe, who has the sovereign power and right to do so as he pleases in his world. We see this very truth testified to us as well from the Gospel of Luke in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 35, we read that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. He will reign over all of God's people forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that truth. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, in light of hearing this, understanding that she's a virgin, betrothed to Joseph, never been with a man, Mary says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, church, God the Son, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was conceived by God himself. He was miraculously placed into the womb of Mary without any form of human conception being involved whatsoever. And we need to understand this morning, if we already don't, that this is so important, beloved. This is so important. Understanding this truth is so important when it comes to the faith that has been delivered to us, the saints, once for all. Amen. Uh, you'll hear so-called pastors, and we'll put quotes around that because they're not, but you're, you'll hear so-called pastors at times say that the virgin birth is not a big deal. The virgin birth isn't a big deal. It's not a matter of first importance. It's something that we can disagree on and still be in the faith, still be brothers and sisters. Well, 
Someone who would say such a foolish statement is not qualified to bear the name of pastor because they do not know the trustworthy word of God. Church, apart from the fact that this is just what God clearly teaches us in his holy scriptures, and which means it should be accepted on just that point and that point alone. I mean, it's just clearly taught in his word. That, that's a big deal in and of itself. Apart from that, if the Lord Jesus Christ had not been conceived by the Holy Spirit, if he had not been miraculously placed into the womb and born of a virgin, then firstly, you couldn't account for the eternality of the Son. You couldn't account for the fact that he is God in and of himself. He is God in the flesh. Because if he's created by human means, then he's not God, but he's a created being who has a beginning. Right? We come into existence in our mother's womb. We have a beginning. We are conceived at a moment in time. And such would be the case for the Lord Jesus if he had been created through human means. He would have a beginning. But here's the thing, church. The Son has existed for an eternity. He has no beginning. He has no beginning. He was in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, John 1, 3. He's not in the made category. He's not in the I had a beginning category. He's in the I didn't have a beginning category. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He wasn't made. He's always existed because he is God in his being. Jesus is eternal just as God is because he is God in his being, he is God in his essence. He is 100% truly God. The second person of the triune Godhead, God the Son. But you see, the normal process of conception would not have produced just a human body and a human nature alone. It would have necessarily produced another person altogether. Another person that had not been in existence before. So, apart from the virgin birth, we would have a purely created Jesus who isn't God, which is a Jesus who is totally contrary to the one revealed to us in Holy Scripture. Isaiah said it well in Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The son has eternally existed with the father and was given to be born. He was not created through normal human means. So, beloved, the virgin birth accounts for the Godship and the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he has always existed. And secondly, another reason why the virgin birth and this miraculous conception within Mary of the Lord Jesus must be affirmed is because if this were not so, then we can have no guarantee of Jesus' sinlessness. If he wasn't born of a virgin, miraculously placed into the womb of Mary, we could have no guarantee of Jesus' sinlessness, of his perfect righteousness. So church, what does the Bible teach us about mankind? Us, here, in and of ourselves, what does it teach us about mankind? We are born sinners. Romans 5.12, we're born sinners because of Adam's sin, our father. He fell and we fell in him. We are, Ephesians 2.3, we are by nature children of wrath. By na that's in our nature, right? We sin because we're sinners by nature. We're by nature children of wrath. We are, Psalm 51, verse 5, brought forth out of the womb in iniquity and sin, conceived in sin. So, beloved, if Jesus was not virgin born, then he would have been born just like us with a sin nature, and then he himself would need to be saved. Then he himself would need a savior. You see, a Jesus who is not virgin born is no savior at all, but he's in the same boat that we're in. He's in the same boat that we're in as well. If he was born with a sin nature, he would then need to be born again, as he would then be by nature a child of wrath like the rest of mankind, like the rest of us. Oh, beloved, but as he has eternally existed, he is placed in Mary's womb miraculously by the Holy Spirit, totally disconnected from the sin nature inherited from the fall through our first father, Adam. Church, I pray you already do, but if you haven't before, do you see why it's so important that we get our doctrine consistent and correct? It's so important. This is, this is a big deal, regardless of what some other foolish people may say and that you may hear. It's so important that we get our teaching right. People say doctrine isn't important. The virgin birth isn't a big deal. Well, is the sinlessness of Jesus and his eternality as God a big deal? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, and amen, it is. Beloved, 
You take away the virgin birth. You take away the miraculous way in which our great God and Savior entered into the world, and you have no Savior whatsoever. You take this away, you have no gospel whatsoever. He's not a Savior, and we're all, just as I mentioned last night with the genealogy, we're all just destined to destruction. The genealogy would continue in another sinner, and another sinner, and another imperfect person, another imperfect person, and we all go to hell. You take away the virgin birth, you have no Savior, you have no gospel. But as we have in our text for this morning, we know that he was. Amen? We know that he was. He was born of a virgin. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary from the Holy Spirit. From the Holy Spirit. That's what the scripture of our God and creator teaches. Praise his name. We have a Savior, church. We have a Savior. We have a gospel. Amen. The birth of our Lord happened in a miraculous way, beloved. Then secondly... It happened in an abnormal way. So it happened in a miraculous way. Secondly, it happened in an abnormal way. And what I mean in this is that obviously, as it is miraculous, it isn't normal. Right? It isn't normal. And you could say that to the human senses, it is so abnormal, it is deceptive. It's deceptive. Because this is not functioning in a way that we would naturally see this working out. It's not going the way that, that we would naturally see this coming about. And we certainly see this from Joseph's perspective, who upon his betrothed wife becoming pregnant, well, church, he doesn't immediately think that this is a good and happy thing, right? Oh, this is wonderful. You're pre- I know we haven't been together. You're pregnant. This is great. No, he doesn't think that. He believes, as anyone else would, that something gravely sinful and rebellious has happened. That something gravely sinful and rebellious has happened. Mary is with child. Verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. He resolved to divorce her. So understandably, Joseph, knowing that they have not been together intimately, believes that Mary, his betrothed wife, has been with another man. He believes that she has broken the seventh commandment in committing adultery and being with someone else. And so... You can see how from a human perspective the birth of Jesus Christ comes about in an abnormal or even a deceptive way. Because with simply how this works in our world, what else is Joseph to think at this point? With how this naturally goes about in our world, what what is he to think? Women get pregnant by being with men. And so since Mary is pregnant, she must have been with a man. She must have. And this is exactly why Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, sought to divorce her Quietly. Now, he certainly, in being a just man, as Matthew records, he certainly had grounds to do so. For the one in Mary's womb, the Lord Jesus, will teach in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 32. will be our verses of the month, uh, months from now. Uh, that everyone who divorces his wife, I quote, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, except on that ground, makes her to commit adultery or causes her to commit adultery. So it was just understood that a woman would remarry and in divorcing your wife without a just cause, you would then actually be making her or forcing her to commit adultery in marrying another man. You are wickedly forcing her into a situation that her God and creator would not have her put in. You're you're forcing her into that by divorcing her without a just cause. But here from Joseph's perspective, that's not what he's doing. That's not what he's doing from his perspective. In his perspective, wrong though it may be, it is wrong. It's a wrong perspective. But in it, Mary has committed sexual immorality in adultery. So his divorcing of her would not be putting her into that position because, again, from his perspective, she already did that herself. She already uh, committed sexual immorality. But as I just said, he is wrong. Amen? Amen. Yeah, he he is. He's wrong. Uh, Beloved, there is a way that seems right to a man. There's a way that seems right. But just because it seems right, that doesn't mean it is. Amen? Amen. Just because it it seems right, feels right from my own perceptions, that doesn't mean that it is. Mere feelings and perceptions are not revealers of truth to us. Feelings and perceptions in and of themselves are not revealers of truth to us, and we see a clear illustration of that here. A very clear and vivid illustration of that here. 
In contrast to Joseph's perceptions, Mary has not committed adultery. Mary has conceived this child by the power of God to do so, and in accordance with his sovereign will to bring salvation to his people. And so what Joseph needs, beloved, is really what many times we need as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what he needs is what many times we need in our walk in the Lord. He needs to have his mind corrected. He needs to have his mind sanctified in accordance with God's truth. He needs to have his mind renewed in accordance with what is true. Brothers and sisters, how many times can we be like Joseph here as well? Thinking in accordance with our feelings, thinking in accordance with our perceptions, and walking by sight instead of walking by faith in what God has revealed to us. How many times can we do that? How many times can we be in that state, even as disciples of our Lord? How many times can we act a certain way simply because of how we feel when we ought to be acting a certain way because that's how God revealed in his word we ought to be acting? Amen? Amen. Beloved, that's why we've been called to take every thought captive to obey Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Not how we feel. Not how we perceive things. But how Christ has commanded us and shown us in his word to perceive things to examine our circumstances. That's why Paul tells the church in Ephesus, this is Ephesians 4, verse 21 to 24, that, and I quote, he says, Assuming that you have heard about Christ and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, right, not in our feelings, not in our perceptions, not in what we think, as the truth is in Jesus, you are to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Beloved, we are to put off the old. We are to put off, put off the old that just thinks in accordance with how we want to think. That just thinks in accordance with what feels good. We are to put off the old that thinks and follows a way that seems right to us in accordance with our deceitful desires, as the apostle says in Ephesians 4. And we are to put on the new that sees all things in God's world, that sees all circumstances that we face within his world that he brings to us in accordance with how he would have us see them through the truth that he has revealed for us in his word, in Christ Jesus. We are to be renewed in our minds, beloved. We are to think the way our creator would have us think, not the other way around. We're not to think just the way we want to think. We're to think the way we've been created to think and how he's revealed that we're to think in his word. Because though it's understandable, yes, it is understandable that Joseph would be thinking this way. When you take a step back and you look at the big picture, he is thinking in a very sinful way. He is thinking in a very sinful way. Joseph is naturally thinking here that God's plan to bring forth the Messiah, God's plan to bring forth the Christ, the one he promised back in Genesis 3.15, is a bad plan. And he wants no part of it. He wants no part of the plan at all. And he would have had no part of the plan if it weren't for the great condescending grace of our wondrous God to change his thinking, to change his mind, as he so graciously does for us as well in our sanctification. As he grows us, his people, in the truth and conforms us more and more into the image of the Son. So what do we read here? Joseph is seeking to divorce her quietly, verse 20 to 21, but... As he considered these things, as he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. You shall do this. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He needed his thinking changed, beloved. He needed his mind renewed. He needed to walk by faith in what God has revealed instead of how he was just perceiving things by his own feelings. He needed it changed, and God graciously gave it to him, gave it to his child through his messenger. Don't think that way, Joseph. Don't think that way. That's not how God would have you think. You're seeing this wrongly. Take her as your wife. She hasn't committed adultery. For God has sovereignly placed that child within her, and this very same one you will name Jesus, because he will save his people, yourself included, from their sins. 
There's something greater here than you could ever imagine, Joseph. You need to have your mind renewed. That's essentially what he's saying. You're thinking wrong, Joseph. You need to think this way and you need to walk in this. You need to think this way and walk in accordance with this. Church, praise God that he gives his people that correction and discipline that we need. Amen? Praise God that he does so. Praise God that his love for his people is seen not in just being nice to us and comforting us in our wrong and sinful thinking, essentially the love that the world likes to show, pampering people down a path of falsehood and lies and opinion. But our God's true love is seen in coming to us for reproof, that we would be zealous and repent and think rightly before him as his image bearers. And oh, how that is preeminently seen in the sending of the Son. How that is preeminently seen in the sending of this one in Mary's womb who would not be born so that we could start a holiday with a pure focus on lights and presence and an imaginary man, but who would be born to save his people from their sins. Amen? Amen. Who would be born to save his people from their sins, entering into his own creation on behalf of his people and to the glory of the Father. The Lord Jesus, truly God, truly man, lives the perfect life of righteousness that we never could. Providing the righteousness needed to be justified in the sight of our God so that our holy God, who cannot look upon evil with favor, can look upon us with favor as we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ as it is imputed to us by faith. And he goes to the cross, dying the death that we deserve because of our sin. Going to the cross, taking upon himself the wrath and the justice of God for his people. He dies our death. The death that we deserve because of our sinful thoughts and our sinful actions. And he rises from the dead on the third day to ever live to see to it that his people, his, his people, whom he came to save, are saved. So to the uttermost. Praise God. Praise God. Reconciled to God, granted eternal life, and ultimately raised up to the fullness thereof on the last day. He paid it all, beloved. He accomplished everything necessary for salvation in his life, death, and resurrection for us, for his people, his church, so that we could be utterly reconciled to God through faith in him alone. Amen. And being reconciled to God through Christ, we are given new hearts that no longer want to live in accordance with our own opinions, that no longer want to live in accordance with our own feelings, but want to live in accordance with the truth our God has revealed for us in his word. His commandments are not burdensome to us any longer in being born again, beloved. They're not burdensome. We want to follow him. We want to think in accordance with his truth. We want to deny ourselves and follow him because we found in him everything that we need as God has changed our hearts in Christ Jesus. The love of God has sent the Son so that his people would be corrected by his grace to love and worship him instead of ourselves. He sent the Son to save us from our sins so that we can think and live as we ought to as his image bearers. In church this morning, if that doesn't get you excited, if that doesn't fill you with joy, if that, that message of who Christ is, of who God has been for us in Christ Jesus, what he does for us in Christ Jesus, if that doesn't fill you with joy and you need some light, some presence, and some made-up story to do that for you, then you need a change of thinking just like Joseph did. Amen. You need a change of thinking just like Joseph did. Just as he, you've been deceived by your own feelings and perceptions, and you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You need to be renewed. You need to see the beauty of who God is as revealed in Christ Jesus, and by his grace, repent. Brothers and sisters, may we ever praise our God with joy that Jesus was born to save his people from their sins. Amen? May we praise God for the abnormal way in which he came. Because it is the way that our eternally wise God has chosen. He whose thoughts and ways are, are infinitely higher than ours. So, the birth of Jesus Christ happened in a miraculous way. It happened in an abnormal way. Thirdly, it happened in a fulfilling way. A fulfilling way. Verse 22 to 23, Matthew says, All this took place... To fulfill, to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, he quotes the prophet here. This is Isaiah 7, 14. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So Matthew says that all of this that he has communicated to us, all, that, all this that we, we went through thus far, has happened to fulfill or to bring to pass or to accomplish that which God had already spoken some 700 years before, 700 years earlier through the prophet Isaiah. 700 years before the Lord Jesus was conceived in this miraculous and abnormal way, the Lord spoke through Isaiah these very words in Isaiah 7, 14. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which... Matthew then gives us the interpretation of that name, finishing verse 23, that that name Emmanuel means God with us. So in its original context, when this first came through the prophet Isaiah, in its original context, this promise was given to King Ahaz. King Ahaz was king of the nation of Judah at that time, the southern kingdom, and it came to him in the midst of his unfaithfulness to God. King Ahaz was in the line of King David, and the Lord had promised that that line would endure, something that we went through last night and mentioned as well, that the line of King David would endure. But when military threat from Syria and Ephraim had come upon the nation, King Ahaz rebelliously put his faith in an alliance with the nation of Assyria instead of just trusting the Lord his God to bring apart, uh, bring apart what he would, had promised, to bring to pass what he had promised. And that is exactly why Isaiah states, beginning in 7.13, so the verse before the promise of the sign. He says, Hear then, O house of David, speaking to Ahaz, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? That you weary my God and not trusting in him and losing faith and, and trusting in this alliance with another nation? He says, Therefore, because of this, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall... Call his name Emmanuel. Certainly Ahaz wouldn't live himself to actually see the fulfillment of this sign. But what God is showing through this promise is that even the disobedience and faithlessness within the house of David will not make void nor alter his promise and plan that David's throne would reign forever. Even David's own line cannot mess this up. No one can. Why? Why? Because the plans of God's heart endure through all generations. And no one can stop that which he has promised to do. Nothing can stop him from accomplishing his sovereign will. The king Ahaz could lead the whole line of David and the people of Judah to be faithless against the Lord. But church, that does not handcuff God and bring him to pass what he has promised. It doesn't stop him. Uh, he does whatever he pleases in his creation. Our God is sovereign to bring to pass his eternally wise will. Thus our God promises to bring a righteous king, this Emmanuel, this God with us through a virgin for his people. And we see right here as Matthew records that he has done this for us. He has fulfilled this. He has accomplished this in Jesus Christ. The very one we read of earlier from Luke who will be given the throne of his father David and who will reign over the house of Jacob forever seeing no end to his kingdom at all. In Matthew showing us the fulfillment of this promise here in Jesus Christ Church, we see the same thing that we saw last evening in covering Jesus' genealogy, the fact that our God is faithful to all of his promises. He's faithful to all of his promises and that no sinner, no person at all, has the power to frustrate the working out of his plans an inkling, a bit. God said that the virgin will conceive and bear a son. He said that the son would be God with us, would be him with us, God in the flesh, and church, he did it just as he said he would. He did it just as he said he would. And praise God for his utter faithfulness. Praise God in the sending of the Son, for the, for the Word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, truly God and truly man, in fulfillment of this promise 700 years before it happened. Praise him that he is God and there is none other. That he is God and there is none like him. He who declares the beginning from the end. From ancient times, things not yet done, saying that his counsel shall stand and he will accomplish all of his purpose. Praise him. Beloved, we've seen this morning that the birth of Jesus Christ happened in a miraculous way. It happened in an abnormal way. It happened in a fulfilling way. 
And lastly, as we close, we ask the, the, the question of how should we respond? How should we respond to such beautiful truths that we've seen from the Word of God this morning? And church, I would say we should respond to this with the same heart that our brother Joseph responded with. A heart of love for God and Christ and thus obedience to his commands. What do we see here after all this? Verse 24 to 25. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. So he did exactly what God commanded him to do through his angel. He did exactly what God commanded him to do through his messenger. He took Mary his wife. He took Mary his wife, accepting by faith that she had not committed adultery as he had previously perceived, but that the child within her womb indeed had been uh, conceived from the Holy Spirit. And when the child was born, just as he was commanded by God through his messenger, he named the child Jesus, just as he was commanded to do so. The brothers and sisters, as Joseph was an example to us of wrong thinking in accordance with our feelings, he is just as well an example to us of being a just man, uh, being one who walks in accordance with the commandments of God and what God has revealed to him. As Matthew called him earlier, a just man. Beloved, this is humility put on display here through our brother Joseph. And by the grace of God, allowing his mind to be conformed to the truth. Not, qu not questioning the truth by his own uh, perceptions but submitting, humbly submitting to the truth of God and having his mind renewed by it, submitting to the truth of his Lord and furthermore walking in that truth. And beloved, as disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus, this must be us as well. This must be us as well. Humbly submitting to the truth of God, but not stopping there, walking in it, obeying his commands out of love for him. It's not enough to just have our mind corrected not enough to just have the truth within, but we must walk in that truth as well. It's not enough to be mere hearers of the word alone, deceiving ourselves, but we must be doers of the word, James 1.22. So brothers and sisters, just as our brother Joseph, may we, out of our love for God, may we, out of our love for him, obey his commandments that he has clearly revealed, revealed for us in his word, obeying all of them. And may we be reminded this Christmas Lord's Day morning that in Christ Jesus we have been greatly enabled to do so. Amen? Amen? We have all that we ever need in Christ Jesus to do that which our God has commanded to us in his word. We have all that we ever need. We, we can endure, beloved. We can endure righteously in all things through this one who was born to save his people from their sins. That which he will do. Again, not a might or a maybe, that which he will do. And if you're in Christ this morning, that which he is doing uh, experientially as you're being sanctified to serve the Lord more experientially in your life, in your hearts and minds. For God so loved the world, Brookside, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And may he bless the preaching of his word this morning that more would be granted the grace through it, through the preaching of his word, to believe and entrust themselves to the Son. Would he grant that even this morning? That even some within us who haven't would entrust themselves to the Son, would, but would obey their God and Creator by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless the preaching of his word to that end, and may he bless it that we who possess eternal life now in the Son would grow within it. Amen? We grow in eternal life. May he bless it by his grace and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We bless your name. Father, thank you for giving us this day. Thank you for giving us this day that we can rest and worship you. Thank you for giving us this day that we can come together with your saints. Partake of your means of grace, not alone, but together. For you have not called us to yourself to be by ourselves, but you've called us to yourself to be with your people. We're no longer strangers and aliens. We're no longer exiles to the covenants of promise. But in Christ, we've been brought near. In Christ, we are fellow members of the household of God, fellow saints and members of your household. 
a part of your covenant people. For we are the circumcision. We are Israel. We are your covenant people who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Praise your name that we can come together and, and put that on display as you have revealed that we ought to in your word. A way that is most glorifying to you and most full of joy for us as we follow the way that you have regulated for us to worship you. Father, thank you for this day as well as it is Christmas Day along with this Lord's Day. That we can come together in this Lord's Day and take this special occasion to give thanks to you for the sending of the Son. For the miraculous birth of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus. How, how you wonderfully, as, as was said last night, how, how you wonderfully strike straight blows with crooked <laughs> sticks through, through all of these sinners, imperfect person after imperfect person. Through all of these, you bring forth the perfect one. How greatly in that genealogy, Father, you, you show forth that nothing can, can stop your plans. Nothing can frustrate you. For if we could, we would. Praise your name that you will in this one who, who entered into the world and was born to save his people. You perfectly put on display that, that, that you will fulfill all that you've promised to us in him. You who have begun a good work for us in Christ Jesus, converting us bringing us uh, from, from vessels of no use to vessels of use for you, bringing us out of darkness into light, you will complete that work in him. Praise be to your name for that. Father, may, may the hearts of your people be filled with joy this morning, be filled with love. May, may Christ be exalted in our hearts. Spirit of God, would you work that out in our hearts this morning? I pray that it's been as Christ has been exalted and preached through your word. May you bless the preaching of your word. May you bless the hearing of it for, for its purpose, that we would be more conformed into the image of the Son. May you bless the rest of our day. Father, we love you. God the Son, we love you. Spirit of God, we love you. We praise you for these things. We praise you for this day. We praise you for this worship. May you bless it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.